But so, speaking on this panel about governance, policy, and accreditation issues, we have Tammy McElvoy, who is the head of schools for Logos Preparatory Academy in Sugar Land, Texas, and is secretary, secretary for the board of directors of the National Association of University Model Schools. We have Dr. Kara Stoops, who is the director of the Center for Effective Education at the John Locke Foundation in North Carolina. He's co-founder of the Carolina Charter Academy and was appointed to the North Carolina Charter School Advisory Board. And we have Carrie McDonald, who is a senior fellow at the Foundation for Economic Education and host of the weekly Liberate Ed podcast, which y'all should check out. Um, she's an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute and a regular contributor to Forbes. So uh, take it away. We haven't established an order, <laughs> so uh, any volunteers? <laughs> Sam's slides are up. I know. My slides are up. And All right, let's, let's do it. Let's that. do it. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so I'm glad to get to spend some time with you guys today on this riveting subject. But it is a very important one. Um, so this this is actually pulled straight from our slide deck. I love this quote. It's the it's from the slides that we use when we have prospective parents coming for their first meeting. And um, from Michael Thompson, he's a New York Times bestselling author and psychologist specializing in children and families. And he makes the point that viewed from a distance, all schools look kind of the same. That viewed viewed up close, they're extraordinarily different. <clears throat> and why that's important to us is because we're intentionally different. Is, is whatever your whatever type of hybrid school you are, you're intentionally different. Okay. Now, when we started our school, we're University Model School, 16 years ago, um, and we would ask parents, "Have you ever heard of University Model School?" We got a lot of blank stares. You know, they had no idea what we were talking about. And while now more people are understanding what University Model School, after COVID, everyone has some idea of what <laughs> hybrid school means. Okay. But what that means <laughs> is very, very different. Maybe it's an excellent school that's providing an excellent education to students, or maybe it's that terrible thing that the public schools did when they got shut down. All right. So more than ever, it's important for us to do the things that show the outside looking in that we are schools of excellence um, and that we're credible. And that, to me, that's what accreditation is all about, which is kind of where I'm going to focus my next few minutes. Um, excellence is one of our school's core values, and we use the plumb line to illustrate that. That's what the little picture is. Um, and a plumb line is a carpenter school that measures the depth and the uprightness of a thing. Okay. So for to me, when I think of the things we're going to talk about today, governance, policy, accreditation, these are things that give your school depth and helps your school stand upright. Because it's not momentary excellence that you're going for, but a plan for future excellence. Kind of what Bo was talking about. He's thinking 30 years down the road. It's not uncommon in our boardroom to say, what are we going to look like in 100 years? Okay, so you want your school to go well beyond yourself. And these tools are helpful in that, in that regard. So a couple of um, symbols that have come to, to mean this to the outside world are um, University Model School is to being certified as University Model School, which we are as a school, and accredited. Our accrediting agency is Cognia, um, and it just shows that we're submitting ourselves to quality control. We have someone coming in and, and evaluating our programs based on standards and certifying that we meet or exceed those standards. Cognia is, um, as I said, our accrediting agency. The whole idea of accreditation started back in the late 1800s, um, and it was, you know, can we have some kind of a regulation of what kids are learning in high school so that when they get to college, we know where they are. It's a little bit standardized. There were six accrediting agencies formed for the nation. And today, those agencies actually accredit worldwide, pre-K through upper ed. And so for us in Texas, we go through Cognia. Um, and again, it's, it's having that outside look um, as to what, what's happening at your school. And they're helping focus schools on continuous improvement. Right, in areas of leadership, learning, and resource capacity. Um, so they're, they're giving you kind of diagnostics to stimulate your plans to be improving in these areas. So it might seem, you know, it might feel like, oh, they're coming in to tell us what to do. Um, not at all. They're coming in to help you do what you do better by giving you tools and helping you identify what are our strengths, what are our areas of opportunities, what are our limitations, how do we 
grow our programs, and it's, that's highly important. So very quickly, if you haven't been through the process, this is what it looks like. And first of all, like I said, they have a set of standards. So, so the people coming in to credit, you have a set of standards, and you're going to have those ahead of time. That's the good news. Um, and then your first job is to show them what you have that can be sent, you know, in, in email now or on the internet um, to prove that your school at least has a plan to meet these standards. Okay, now that's going to be a lot of times in forms of your handbooks. Um, what are your teacher certifications? What are your scores? Things like that. And they're going to review all of that. And then they're going to send a team to your campus. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, and then you, it's granted or not. With the whole goal being that that feedback you get from this process then leads to your school's five or six year strategic plan, which you need one, all right? If we're always just living in the moment, we're not improving, all right? And it, within that is your annual improvement plan for your school okay so that it drives all of that the visit itself and the team's going to look over all of your things and then they're going to come onto your campus and um, they want to see that yes what is said here is what is happening they're going to interview a lot of people now if you say xyz is your policy and they interview 50 people that have never heard of xyz what they know is that xyz is just an idea it's not a policy at all, okay? We can write lots of great things down, but are we putting them into practice? And that's what the visit's all about. Again, it's not meant to be we're coming in to you know, find out what's wrong with your school. Um, they're really just coming in to, to marry what you've told them about your school with what they're seeing happening and to help you understand if it's not. Okay. Um, they're going to use their standards, and I'll talk a bit more about standards, to, to evaluate your learning environment. It's not just whatever my opinion is that day, okay? It is based on a rubric, basically. Um, educators like rubrics. And um, then, as I said before, they're going to provide that in, in, in feedback. Now, here's where it gets tricky for hybrid schools. So, Cognia has a set of standards, right? It's they review it, they go over it all the time, but from the very beginning, it was written based on traditional schools. All right, their standards are very much with traditional schools in mind. The people from Cognia, typically, that are coming to evaluate your school are from traditional schools, okay? So, if there's no one on that team that can wrap their mind around what you're doing, they have no idea how to compare those standards with your program. So for, for a number of years, what, what the University Model School Association would do would be, okay, a school's getting accredited, we're gonna campaign and make sure we have a University Model School person on that team, right? Um, now, NOMS is actually um, achieved systems accreditation, which means if you're certified by NOMS, you're also accredited on um, that automatically, the Iconia, and I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. But that is a danger, and I know some of your states, like Georgia has a state accrediting agency, I don't know what that looks like, um, but that's certainly something you know to be mindful of when these people are coming in. They're not just going to get your school if all they've ever done is traditional education. NOMS, um, the National Association of University Model School, was actually started in 2002. There had been a school, much like some of the stories you heard today, Bo is a university model school. Some parents had started a school, and it was super successful, and actually taught there when they were a, a, a young school. And they were having trouble running their school because people were calling, how do we get a school like yours? How do we get a school like yours? And they're like, we're trying to teach school here. We don't have time to help you start your school. Um, so they started NOMS. And Barbara Freeman, who's actually still the CEO of NOMS, um, had, had come out of public education. And the first thing she did, she said, we've got to credit your school. Okay, we've got to do that. She had a granddaughter going to the school at the time. So she was seeing from the inside out the quality but she knew very well that people looking in were not seeing that many accidents. And she was really having to trailblaze. It was not easy. It wasn't just like, okay, we have this school that looks really weird and you all have no idea what we're doing and we want you to credit us. I was like, okay, sure, let's do it. Um, she had to really work to get that first accreditation of that school. But having so done, now when our school came a few years later to be accredited, we had a trail to follow. So she worked really hard. She got it done in 2003, and then in 2006, she actually had NOMS accredited, and now this past summer, we got the systems accreditation. And what that means is Cognia has said the standards of a university model school are, are, have the excellence that we expect, 
and if you're certified as a university model school, then we'll automatically accredit you under Cognia. And so what that means for university model schools is you know who's coming in to accredit my school? People that get my school, right? And accreditation's not a one-time one process. You do it in, with Cognia and university model school, you do it every five years. So I want to know that the people looking at my school understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. And so that's something that, that NOMS is able to give us. Um, the standards cover for NOMS cover academics, as you would expect, um, because we are a distinctively Christian organization. They discover, uh, cover spiritual formation and family ministry, student ministries program, governance and program support. And they're really designed to help schools avoid some of the big pitfalls that happen. Um, a board that doesn't get the vision. If you have a board that doesn't understand why you do school, and maybe they love your whatever, but if they don't understand why you do things the way you do it, then if you're going to be one of those stories that when the founders found the school's change, changes, okay? Financial policies that don't sustain the school, right? Those are things that they're helping the schools avoid. Do you understand what it means to be 501c3? Are you filing a 990? Are you paying your payroll taxes? Um, do you have a budget that works and is sustainable? Um, is there a strong working relationship between a strong board and a strong head of school or administration? Okay, so they're looking at all of this, and they want to know that you know your state standards, because every state has their own standards, right? And so non-schools have to meet or exceed those standards, and they're looking at that. It's important to stay educated and all of that. The other benefits of the university model are the trademark. So if, if someone's properly using the name university model, they're going through this process, and that brings accountability. They've met these standards, okay? And with that comes credibility, all right? And a strong partnership model. So we, like your schools, there's a home family, home school partnership, right, at the school level, but we have an association school partnership, and we have a school-to-school -school partnership. Bo and I are both in Houston. We work very closely together, okay? We want each other to succeed. And I've, we've joked about this before. If he's messing it up, I'm gonna go tell him. Quit doing that, and he's gonna do the same. So we have a very supportive community of educators. I'm gonna end here. This past year, Lewis Prep was named um, a National Blue Ribbon School by the United States Department um, of Education. And that, if you've been in education, if you've been in public education, you know that's a really big deal. It's, it's a difficult honor to achieve. And it was like an exciting experience, but for me, one of the most exciting things about it was, was being able to go to the award ceremony with 800 other educators from 325 schools, mostly public, 26 non-public, um, and just learn about what's happening in Washington. You know, we also have state level, we'll talk about that in a minute, in Washington um, to campaign for our right to do what we do. We had to apply to an organization called CAPE. Um, they're the Council for, for American Private Educators, and you should know about them. Unfortunately, Georgia doesn't have a state um, organization from them, but um, many states do, most do. Uh, and they are, they are actively in Washington, D.C., campaigning for private schools and the needs of private schools. And then they have state organizations in many states. So in Texas, there's a gal named Laura, um, and she's with the Texas Private um, Educators Association. She's, I, I'm on a Zoom call with her every Tuesday, hearing about what's happening in Austin. She'll say, hey, and she'll also say, hey, this is happening in this other state, and we're worried this is gonna hit Texas. So that we're knowing, A, what's happening right now that we need to be aware of, what we need to be fight, trying to fight against, and what we need to be aware of could be coming. And that's so, so important, because here's the deal. I didn't meet anyone else from a hybrid school at that Blue Ribbon Conference, okay? I, as far as I know, there's no one else there. Right, and maybe no, maybe no hybrid schools ever gotten it. Who knows? But we might have been the first, but we will not be the last. This is a model that is here to stay, and we need to make, need to make sure it's a model that's protected. And policies, all of governance, all those things sound scary, but that's going to be the thing that allows us to keep doing what we do with excellence, not just for a few years, but for a Uh, I'll go next since we'll, we'll, we'll go down the order. Uh, in 2020, the Will Skillman Fellow at the Heritage Foundation, Jonathan Butcher, published a report that looked at the state of regulations of learning pods, uh, all 50 states. And as I leaped through this report, I came to North Carolina, and, and John Locke Foundation is a North Carolina-based organization. 
And Jonathan Butcher, the Will Skillman Fellow at the Heritage Foundation, put warning, North Carolina is a high regulation state. And I said, how dare Jonathan Butcher, the Will Skillman Fellow at the Heritage Foundation, slander the name of North Carolina by calling us a high regulation state? But rather than challenge Jonathan to a fight, which I would definitely lose, I decided to think a little more deeply about what policymaking really looks like and the difference between laws that are on the books and laws that are in practice. And so I'm going to ask three questions that really form the basis of, of the way that I think about how hybrid schools, pods, and the various other configurations that we we're going to talk about uh, could be analyzed to get a deeper understanding of the policymaking environment. Really, in North Carolina, our approach to hybrid schools is really like a baguette. Uh, it's really hard and crusty on the outside, but really soft, and there isn't really much to it on the inside. And all of you are thinking, yeah, the fat guy chooses the car. <laughs> that's fine. You know, that's fine. And that's also why I would lose the fight to Jonathan Butcher, the Will Skillman Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. That's, that's okay. Um, because we have plenty of laws on the books in North Carolina that uh, look really intimidating and look really worrisome, but really do very little in practice. And uh, for example, I'll give you some, some fun examples before I actually get into schools. North Carolina has a law that prohibits singing off key in church. <laughs> and in 1873, there was someone that was actually convicted of uh, and, yes, yeah. and Ben is like, this is a great idea of, of disrespecting their congregation and God by singing off key in church. But the reality is, is that no, no one is monitoring singing off key in church. Um, there's another law that prohibits farmers from plowing their fields using elephants. And if you're going to ask why, why would a North Carolina lawmaker actually consider a law like that? I, I actually have no idea why elephants are a bad idea for plowing fields. But regardless, these are laws that are still on the books that are very, really meaningless when it comes to the actual practice and monitoring of the thing that it's meant to monitor or uh, or understand. So. I, I'm going to, here's the first of my three questions that I ask. How does a state slash media define a hybrid school? And I'm going to use all my examples from North Carolina because that's what I know best. And North Carolina does not define a hybrid school. There's nothing in statute that defines it. Um, but the media has defined it. And interestingly enough, this is really strange, but it only defines a hybrid school in terms of public schooling. From the 1950s to the 1990s, the media called a hybrid school those school districts that were under desegregation orders, that were incorporating a combination of magnet schools and forced busing. That was a hybrid school in North Carolina for 40 years. And then charter schools came online, and that became the new definition of a, of a, of a hybrid school. Because that was to them, even though statute says that they are public schools, a hybrid private and public school. Well, no, that's, that's really not the case at all, but that's how they defined it. And then in the 2010s or so, there was a new definition of hybrid schooling that defined it as an early college program. These are programs where high school students spend their first two years in a high, public high school and then go to a community college where they earn their uh, 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 diploma and uh, get credits toward a, a uh, associate's degree. That's how the media defined hybrid school. Never uh, in a million years were they thinking about configurations that involved a home school or a private school. So question one, how does the state or media define a hybrid school? Chances are it's much different than you think it is if it's not defined in statute. Question number two, who is in charge of what? North Carolina has a very decentralized governance system with different agencies involved with different types of schools. So for example, our home schools and private schools are uh, underneath the Division of Non-Public Education, which is a office within the Department of Administration, which is one of the governor's cabinet offices. Uh, 
they have maybe three employees overseeing 180,000 homeschoolers and 107,000 private schools. They are the ones that are the regulatory body overseeing it. Do you think that they are going to go and start knocking on doors, all three of them? <laughs> no, they're not. The uh, Department of Public Instruction and the North Carolina State Board of Education oversee our traditional public schools, and we have a completely different agency that oversees our uh, private school voucher programs and our education savings account programs. Uh, we have around 25% of our student population in schools of choice in North Carolina, uh, and yet there are different offices, different groups overseeing all the different configurations that we have in North Carolina, and um, you're going to have a lot different type of environment if you are in a state that only has one or two entities, especially strong regulatory agencies that oversee the types of oversight in your state. Um, I forgot to add that the uh, North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services oversees our child care facilities. Um, some certain types of uh, uh, pods or tutorial organizations can be considered child care organizations. Uh, and you'll love some of the definitions that they use. So for example, um, if you're a tutoring or a supplemental enrichment program, you are subject to child care regulations if it is a program or arrangement where three or more children less than 13 years old who do not reside where the care is provided receive care on a regular basis of at least one uh, once per week for more than four hours but less than 24 hours per day from persons other than their guardians or full-time custodians or from persons not related to them by birth, marriage, or adoption. Um, so, that's actually one of the clearer ones. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Uh, and if anyone wants the child care rules, I have all 44 pages right here. Um, but if, if you're faced with the prospect of something like that, you're just going to go register as a private school, which is really easy to do in North Carolina. You're not going to bother with the Department of Health and Human Services. And, and I'm not kidding, one of the required pieces of paperwork that you have to submit if you're uh, applying as a child care facility, is you have to talk about, uh, you have to submit paperwork for the uh, vaccination status of your pets, like your dog. Um, so you have to make, make sure that the dogs are fully vaccinated against uh, who knows what, bubonic plague, and, you know. Yeah, they can't have rabies. That's I, I think that's the bottom line. But uh, that's uh, part of the, uh, the child care arrangements that, or the child care regulations that govern certain types of arrangements in, in North Carolina. And then the third question I always ask is, what is the political landscape? Because even if you have a very strong regulatory body, you might have uh, lawmakers and regulators running the other way if they find that a political sledgehammer is coming their way. And I can tell you this, the homeschool population in North Carolina is said sledgehammer. <laughs> Very recently, a freshman member of the North Carolina General Assembly very innocently asked a question during a committee meeting. She said, uh, tell me more about these home, this homeschool testing and why we don't know more about it. It was impossible to reach her office by phone for two days. There is no one that can mobilize faster than the homeschool community in North Carolina. And one of the things that I always tell freshman members of the General Assembly, although she obviously didn't get the message, is that if you're a Republican in North Carolina, there are two groups you don't mess with, gun owners and homeschoolers. And she messed with the homeschoolers, and now she understands very well what I was saying was absolutely true. The political landscape uh, prohibits a lot of wannabe tyrants from either using state law to try to shut down alternative configurations of schooling or to issue additional regulations that will prohibit things like hybrid schools and pods and other ways of providing education uh, in North Carolina. So those are the th three questions that I ask, and that's the framework that I use uh, thinking beyond what the words on the page of North Carolina general statutes and what our regulatory bodies uh, have imposed on schools. 
Uh, I will add one uh, additional thing before, before I end is that pay attention to what your regulatory bodies are talking about. And, and in North Carolina, we have something called the Rules Review Commission. And they review uh, rules that are uh, requested by agencies that are outside of the legislative process. And they're usually subject to public input. And uh, it, our Revo Rules Review Commission is very sensitive to the fact that when you have stakeholders that are objecting to rules, they take it very seriously and they're able to shut them down. Now, fortunately, uh, in North Carolina, no one has dared try to use the Rules Review Commission to impose regulations on North Carolina's homeschoolers, and I don't think they ever will because this last year we had 180,000 homeschoolers. I think we're going to hit 200,000 this year, which, and I'm, I'm going to say this with all, all the pride in the world, as a percentage of a student population is the largest share of homeschoolers in the nation. Wow. Uh, I'm so excited to be here today. There's such energy, excitement in the homeschool world and in the hybrid school world and in entrepreneurship more generally. That's the thing that I'm really excited about lately is I feel like we are energized as a culture around an entrepreneurial spirit, particularly in education. And from a policy perspective, while we can continue to push forward for education choice, school choice policies, parental empowerment, and all of that, I really think that we should also be pushing to make it easier for ed education entrepreneurs in particular to launch new learning models, whether it's a hybrid school, whether it's a scalable you know, ed tech company, um, whether it's some kind of homeschool collaborative and so on. It's, it's thinking about entrepreneurship um, and making that easier. And certainly, you know, entrepreneurship is hard for anyone, uh, but particularly for education entrepreneurs, of course, as many of you know, because it's so highly regulated, because there are 44 pages of uh, licensing requirements in some states to go through. And so the key is how do we deregulate? Right? So instead of adding policies that say, you know, pods will be protected or hybrid schools are a legitimate learning model and so on, how do we instead pare down some of those 44 pages? How can we um, maybe expand exemptions so that it becomes this kind of leaky bucket uh, in terms of, um, you know, the, 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 lice, the uh, regulations tend to go away because there are so many exemptions and people are able to kind of uh, opt out of it. And that's the kind of thing that I'm focused on. And I'll tell you a, a quick story of why I think that this is a kind of golden moment for this, why I think there's a lot of public support. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was presenting at a Students for Liberty conference in Boston, where I live. And uh, Students for Liberty is a national network of student libertarian groups on college campuses across the country, and they have several regional uh, conferences, and this was their Northeast Regional Conference. And I was going to be talking about education entrepreneurship. I arrived early and got a sense of the conference. And the student organizer, I think to his credit, really tried to make this a big tent event. And so there were certainly kind of the libertarian focused people and libertarian speakers. But he also, I think, wanted to get um, members of the kind of greater Boston community, who may not be sympathetic, surprisingly, to libertarian <laughs> values, um, together on common issues. And one of those, or two of those key common issues are ending the war on drugs and criminal justice reform. And so that was what they were there for. And there were a lot of community members and there were Boston City Council members presenting. So it was really fascinating. And, and I was glad that I, I was able to come early and kind of get a sense of who the audience was, that it wasn't just this libertarian group that I was going to be talking to. Uh, and so I was listening to the Boston City Councilors uh, giving their proposals and talking about all the things they're working on. And then at one point, one of them said, and that's why we need to pass rent control. And half the group cheered. And I said, uh-oh. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, libertarians are very much against rent control. Um, so I thought, you know, how is my discussion, my presentation on education entrepreneurship and parent empowerment and exit government schools, all this, how's that going to go over? Sure enough, it went over really, really well. And I was so surprised that the same people, literally the same people who were cheering for rent control, were really excited about parent autonomy and empowerment and an entrepreneurial spirit and creating new learning models and 
supporting education entrepreneurship. I have people coming up after me saying, you know, can I reach out to you? I have an idea for, a, you know, a new micro school. Um, and so I think that for, for me, that was a really telling moment around um, bipartisan support for education entrepreneurship. So while things like school choice policies continue to be contentious um, for a lot of different reasons from a lot of different people, I don't see that same kind of animosity when we uh, position it as education entrepreneurship and making uh, states kind of cultivate a culture of education entrepreneurship. So I think there's a lot of room there and, I, and I'll just share a couple of examples um, of you know, kind of what I mean, how we can facilitate more education entrepreneurship and remove barriers, because I think the opportunity cost of regulation uh, is quite high in terms of preventing a lot of growth in education entrepreneurship. So I'll start with an example of um, a brand new type of learning model, a completely new category right here in Georgia. There's a, a, he was a tech entrepreneur turned kind of education entrepreneur named Chris Turner, who runs a co-learning center. It's like a WeWork for kids uh, in Decatur, Georgia. It's called Moonrise. It's moonrise.com. And he was so trying to solve a problem for his own children. He wasn't happy with any of the models available to him here and decided to create something new. He was homeschooling but wanted something a little bit, you know, more of a community and more access to different mentors and different resources and, and all of that. So he created Moonrise. It runs on this kind of membership model, like a gym membership or like a WeWork, where for him they pay $250 a month uh, for a family and they can come as much or as little as they want, as long as there's capacity. They're open nine to nine, seven days a week with all different uh, mentors. He opened just this past four, they had the past, this past fall, excuse me, um, they have capacity for 60 students. He had 375 kids on a waiting list. So huge demand and he expects to grow. He wants to grow, he wants to scale this. As I said, he sold his company in 2017, his tech company, so he's used to kind of where this could go. Um, and he says, you know, he could go into major metropolitan areas and sell out in a day, but he doesn't want to go in those areas because there's probably 144 pages of regulation uh, that he would have to deal with. So instead, he's looking at growing in places like New Hampshire, or Florida, kind of more freedom-friendly, choice-friendly states. And of course, that creates this mismatch between supply and demand. There's a lack of resources in areas where there could be a lot of demand. Uh, and so, you know, I just think that that's a perfect example where there is, where regulation is kind of preventing entrepreneurship. We don't even know what new learning models would be uh, invented. Uh, so, so that's one example, and then I'll, I'll share another one. Um, on my podcast this week, I shared the story of a mom of three named Ada Sali, who lives in Massachusetts, again, where I'm located. And she, during, uh, when COVID hit and everything uh, shut down, all of her kids' homeschooling activities and so forth, she said, no, no, no. My kids are gonna still have some social activities, we're gonna get together, we're gonna find community. So she really worked for a couple of years, over the past couple of years, on kind of building this community of like-minded families um, and having a lot of success with that. And then this fall, as we were kind of leading up to this fall, she said a lot of the families were, um, frustrated by what was happening in the schools, ongoing COVID policies, mandatory mask wearing in Massachusetts schools statewide, and they didn't want to be a part of that. And so she said, all right, well, I'll, let me see if I can fix it. So she decided to open up, lease a building, and open up what she calls a homeschool resource center. Um, she kind of avoided all sorts of licensing regulations, but all of the families are registered homeschoolers in their cities and towns in Massachusetts. Um, they serve kids five to 13, and it's two, three, or five days. So it can be a full-time, um, five-day-a-week option for if you wanted to go five days a week all year, it's about $10,000 a year, which for comparable Massachusetts private schools is actually quite reasonable. Um, and, and, and much, much less, of course, if you do the part-time model. And she said to me in the interview, she said, you know, I don't think this is a problem with parent demand. The parent demand is there. She has families driving up to an hour to go to her program. She said there's really a lack of supply. So again, it gets back to how can we cultivate an environment that um, nurtures education entrepreneurship, that removes barriers, that 
um, works on policies around deregulation or expanding exemptions that enable programs like ADA's to, uh, to grow and, of course, also prevent any encroaching regulation. I was actually sort of worried when my podcast went out that all of a sudden the regulators would be knocking on ADA's door, uh, you know, wondering what she was doing. Um, so I think it's a great time, again, to be an education entrepreneur. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity here, and we just have to keep at regulation at bay. Thank you. We have about 20 minutes or so for questions. So if anyone does, and maybe if you have a question, uh, at the beginning, if you could just introduce yourself, the great part about this conference is people get to meet one another. So just let us know who you are. And it's always nice to actually ask a question in the question time. So uh, again, just, just throwing that out there. Uh, but yeah. Um, I'm Freya Fitzpatrick. I'm from here locally in Georgia. I have a hybrid less than a mile from right where we're sitting. Um, my question is for you about accreditation. Uh, I've gone back and forth and back and forth. I am not accredited every year. I explicitly make the choice, no, I'm not going to do this. Listening to you, I, and I came here because I wanted to hear about it, and I'm still not sold. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm, but I'm amenable to being sold, so like, but you didn't tell me, like, so what, the reason that I keep choosing not to be accredited, and everything you said made me think, and that's why I want to make sure, do I understand this perfectly? Like, I feel like accreditation funnels me into a channel. And the whole reason I do what I do is to get out of this channel. Uh, I mean, I teach two classes specifically, which are not listed in Georgia as fields of study for high school. I can put them down as extra something or another that doesn't count for anything because you're a weird class. There's a designation for that. I can't on there like code 999 or something, but you know, like everything, so like I want to be able to teach things that allow kids' minds to go new places. So what, mm -hmm. do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, so I mean, I, I'm not as familiar with Georgia, obviously, because I'm from Texas. So um, when you are accredited, you are expected to meet or exceed state standards. And I think what you're talking about um, would be exceeding state standards. So if you're able to offer something to your students, that they can't get at the public school down the street, you're exceeding those standards. Now, having said that, and, you know, Texas, it's like, you know, they have to have these classes to graduate, all right? We want that to be the way it is because we want them to go to the university of their choice, and we know that if they're not getting those classes, you know, I, if, if you don't have 190 days plus. So, um, so I think, it, I think it just depends, like, if you let that seem like, oh my gosh, if I don't have it in the classroom for 190 days, I can't do it then it will, but um, you're gonna look different than the school down the street, and that's where it, it's great to have someone on the team that understands that that's possible. Okay, thank you. May I add to that too? Just choosing your accreditation agency wisely, right? Because there are so many different ones mm -hmm. out there, right? So Georgia Accrediting Commission, they're gonna have a set of standards that they're looking for. WASC is gonna be completely different. So you definitely wanna find one that sort of aligns to who you are. Oh, okay, yeah. that, I was unaware of that. Thank you. <laughs> well, and can I just piggyback on that? Because we are accredited with GAC, the Georgia Accrediting Commission, mm -hmm. and we all, and you're, I think your question is, what is the benefit? Yeah. And for us, we only did it because being accredited by that agency allows our high school students to be eligible for, for, Hope. for Hope and Zell Miller. Yeah. Right and away. that was super important to families enrolling in high school for that specific, specific reason. And that they are a little bit more lenient and creative in taking the standards and applying them to non-traditional schools. Um, and, and not just Hope and Zell Miller, but also NCAA. Right. Exactly. So that was a big right. hurdle that I had to leap through. Um, and I, College Board. and Oh, yeah. all, all the above. And it was tricky <laughs> when my kids went from middle school to high school because of that. But, and, and, you know, and I anticipate we'll be talking more about that, but that's why accreditation is such an important topic. Go ahead, you have your hand <laughs> Well, and I was part of a Cognia accreditation review for a large charter network that I used to work at, and Cognia really struggled to understand our system because our system, even though it's a charter network, didn't look the same as all other charter networks. But I think what I would I would stress and I would talk to this group about and talk to Eric about and you know some of the other people here, we need to help educate 
groups like Cognia about the different alternative models because if I wanted to go get my micro school program accredited in the state of Arizona, their rubric would, I wouldn't fit into their rubric. And so I think it's time that we start to get people to pivot and, and say this rubric would work for this type of model, but we need to have other rubrics out there. And the group that you talked about did that. That was the important work that but she did. But the hybrid micro school group now needs to motivate and and accelerate that conversation with some of these accrediting agencies. But what about starting our own accreditation? Exactly. Right. That's well, right. or or that. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And again, is there any is there any research in that or any legwork in that for the panelists? I hear entrepreneurship. <laughs> Been there already. Accreditation isn't necessarily to be prescriptive on our programs, correct? It's to just sort of validate that you are doing what you're saying. Right. It eventually becomes prescriptive. It can't be prescriptive. It's unavoidable. That's true. And it probably depends on who your accreditation team is as well. Yeah. Well, do you believe that the existing accreditation? agencies and organizations are nimble enough to adjust to the changing environment? I guess is no. the question I would ask. No. I would, I would differentiate that. I think this is full disclosure. I work for ACSI, which is an incredible <laughs> I, I would say what was, what was key is I don't think that our important. regional accrediting bodies are nimble enough, but I do think that where they have these articulation agreements, where we've got these intermediaries, whether it's NOMS or ACSI or all these other ones that are out there, um, they are essentially advocates for us. I can tell you to start an accrediting body, it gets harder and harder and harder every year because of the regulations that you're talking about, particularly if you want to operate across state borders. So I think the way to push change, I agree with you, I think we need to push change, but I have seen it most effectively when you have sort of, I don't know what to call it, like. When one of these organizations gets the lead, and then Kanye has gotten more flexible over the last 10 years when it was advanced, it was not yet a whole other conversation. Um, and, that, and so I think those groups are kind of on the leading edge and are pushing these other organizations. Like if you knew in advance, Kanye has done almost a 180 from the rigidity. And I think a lot of it was because these organizations, these partnering organizations, were pushing them and saying, this is ridiculous. We have schools that are doing all these really cool things, and you're pigeonholing everybody. So well, it's also adapting to the times. From a financial standpoint, they need to be invested in the flexibility because that's income for them. Yeah, and I, and I don't want to <laughs> yeah, terrify true. anybody here, but just to say, if you're a faith-based school, that adds a whole other element to the conversation because um, the way the winds are blowing, it is only a matter of time before regional accrediting associations are going to be questioning your faith-based mission and whether or not you meet their um, standards for what that looks like when you include, when you don't include your faith statements, et cetera. So that's something to consider if you're faith-based. Right, there's a question up front here. Yes, been thank patiently you. waiting. <laughs> you're, you're, you're getting the floor. Well, and it's kind of like to pass, but it's to your point and to Tammy. So I'm Melissa Allen, full disclosure as well. <laughs> I'm the Director of Education for the Texas Catholic Conference of Bishops, so I oversee all the 200 plus schools in the state of Texas, but we also accredit our Catholic schools. So we are an accreditation agency in partnership with the TEPSAC. So part of what um, Tammy was talking about was in the state of Texas, um, TEA stopped accrediting Catholic, I mean, the private schools in 1986. Therefore, TPS, I mean, um, the Texas Private School Accreditation Commission was developed, and now we have 17 accredited agencies that accredit private schools in the state of Texas, which TEA recognizes. So we don't have to, quote unquote, follow what the state tells us to, but we do because we want to make sure, like to Tammy's point about the four by four, the graduation requirements, we make sure that our students, if they're recognized by TEA, our Catholic schools, let's say, or any of those 17 accrediting agencies in the state of Texas, they automatically are recognized as, um, I guess, uh, official schools. So the kids and teachers can get credit for their service and then they can graduate with a rec state recognized diploma. So with that being said, we've got a partnership with Cognia as well. And you're absolutely right. Advanced Ed and Cognia are completely two different things now. But part of that partnership was to be able to, um, well, they accepted our accreditation document. 
So what we ended up doing was saying, these are our Catholic identity components, and they accepted it. So when we accredit a school, a school wants to be duly accredited by Cognia, they are automatically accredited if they're accredited by the TCCBAC of approach for Catholic schools. So it's very different in Texas, but we don't have that state regulation that we have to follow. We can adapt if we want to, but we don't necessarily need to do it. So my name is Michelle, I'm from Columbia, South Carolina, and I'm the director of Trinity Homeschool Academy, and we have a resource center and a co-op. I can tell you right now, I appreciate the question that you said, find out your state regulations. My children swim because um, of Tim Tebow law in the public schools. The minute we are classified as a private school, my children cannot do Tim Tebow law in our state. So it is, it is really interesting, I'm hearing this, and I'm very hesitant to even look at my high schoolers as a private school. So we do things very different, very different. But I would like to hear more about the accreditation because it makes me very nervous. I don't want those children. We go through SCAES, which is our state accountability organization, and I get my teachers to send in their syllabus and just say, would you sign off on that? So our third accountability option groups, because there's like hundreds of them, and um, would be okay with those classes being certified. But um, SCAES, we don't do it, we ask that of them. It's not a law. And so it becomes, it's such a gray area in our state. And, and we go through SCAES for NCAA. That's where we go, because I have two swords. And I'm Peggy Dotson, I'm in South Carolina. Okay. So my question actually comes back to the expanding exemption. Because we had, in South Carolina, we had 150 kids and like a wait list of 200 wanting to come near COVID or turning from COVID. And the governor's law was if there were more than 50 people, you had to be a school. Well, we weren't a school, what were we? So I'm calling it just LBA, I'm like, what are we? You know, and we're, we're nothing, we're not defined. But we are childcare because we meet that many hours a week. So Ben Martin, our Siskei's helped me navigate, but we became a private school on paper that only serves homeschooled students. Right. And my kids are athletically eligible. We went through the South Carolina Association Catholic Association. But how do we, I mean, this is we don't want more laws about us. Amen. But we need the exemptions to be clear enough that I don't have to jump through 44 pages of child care law to be able to have these students meet right. more than four hours a day. Um, and we went that route, but I will tell you it actually caused a huge division because there were parents who were convinced that there was no way we could do that. But because they were just in South Carolina, they're so scared about private school yes. label because you lose all access and you end up in. But, but we, we were able to do it, but once again, it would have been so much easier if there was something that said, what are we? Right. Yeah, then, I, then when you're listening, I'm listening, you don't do I really want them to know about me? So, no, you should no. 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 right. but, but we need, ex how do you extend the exemptions to make it where we're not falling into these um, traps of, I mean, it took two months of research, research, board, board members arguing, and you know, just because, we weren't defined. I'd make it loftier, right? I mean, I feel like this is where this term education entrepreneurship, K-12 innovation, new learning models, we don't even know what's a map, you know, what we could imagine could happen if we had all of this freedom. Um, that's the kind of thing that I think gets people excited. And then you're not kind of focused on a particular group. You're not saying we're expanding exemptions for this group or that, you know, hybrid model. It's we don't know what we Let's cultivate a culture in our state that um, encourages all of this innovation and entrepreneurship. Well, and just as a disclaimer, we're in Clemson, and so South Carolina's very conservative, but Clemson is, is not. It's such a um, we're still wearing that. And, um, and I mean, they just got rid of it. Um, Get your center for capitalism. Yeah. But, and so one of those students in my program for that as a city council member. <laughs> um, so then you're running into, you know, um, the, the local laws yeah. are being used. But if there's a way to do the private school accreditation and then still be homeschoolers, I don't know, just can, can I make one more observation? Because in North Carolina, they have a huge athletic system. I mean, they have a huge, just such a support for that. And we are only 10 years into having um, homeschooling athletic group that meets. 
and it's small, but it was an entrepreneurial mom who started it. So I don't know where that balance is. We don't have a Tim Tebow law, and there's a lot of division within North Carolina. And when, when I talk about North Carolina as homogenous, you know that I'm, I'm mis, you know, construing it because there are some people that want Tim Tebow laws, some don't. Some want a tax credit, some don't. Uh, and so the days of having uh, sort of evangelicals that are homeschooling because they're worried about values, that day is long past. We have a diverse homeschool population that has different needs and different desires for what homeschooling could be. We've got about five minutes left, so maybe some questions from the back. Okay, so um, my name is Marisa, and I run the Urban Cottage Educational in Tampa. And so we're genuinely, I have four different LLCs. Um, we are the Wild West, as everyone thinks that it is. Um, and so there's some huge benefits to that. I'm personally a libertarian. I run a program despite being extremely religious. I actually run a secular program. And I think that the business model of a secular program is a really good idea. I told them I don't have time to brainwash your children. I only have time to teach them academics. We hire only professional educators. We run three three-hour course sessions every single day, five days a week. And we're a five to one uh, teacher-student ratio. So the reason that I have found success in this and the, the thing that I want to be careful and bring this point up to people is for me the accreditation part is not the most um, validating thing because I don't have a single person that didn't come to my program because I wasn't accredited um, and I think especially within the political movement that we have the secularization of homeschooling uh, parents are very educated and very diverse in their thoughts um, but I think the bigger thing that we have to look at is that uh, there is also a large patriot movement within the United States that's happened. And so we have to be able to have a program that um, can, can be hospitable to differing values. So I think that is the future. And the biggest thing that I think is really important with that is that we don't get sued. And so I think, I think where I, I don't think the, the issue for my state is that we need to be accredited. Where I have been extremely careful, and the reason I was head nodding significantly, is that within our four LLCs, um, I specifically work even with kids with learning differences, and, um, and we accept a state scholarship, because in Florida, they give up to $10,000 per student if you homeschool and your child has a learning disability um, per year. Um, so we are direct pay providers for that as a group provider. So while we're empowered, I think the thing that's actually going to hit all of us really hard and fast is if someone got, gets hurt in one of our pods, micro schools, something, and something bad actually really happens. And then the media becomes the person who says that there has to be regulation in this. And so that's why I want to challenge even the people as we're here and thinking that. And as a libertarian, I'm like, you know, don't tread on me. Um, but I think we have to be really careful. And that's actually why I went through the process of becoming a qualified child care facility. Um, and that's why, is that I want, to, I want to COA it, right? And so I have all the insurances that we need to. I have all of the things that cover those parts of it. But I think we also have to really genuinely consider what our facilities are, whether it's someone's house or whether it's anything, because all it takes is one child. God bless all of our programs when it goes on national news, like you know that it will, that a child blank. And so I think that's where, like, if we're looking at something that I think we actually need to be looking at regulations, to me it's not about regulations, it's just making sure that we're, we're doing the things that help keep kids physically safe. Um, and so I think that maybe is, I understand it's a different conversation in the legality of it, but I think it's a really vital conversation that we need to be at least thinking about. Um, and why it might be worth to go through the process of being a child care facility, despite the fact that it gives you a little bit of issue. Um, <coughs> when the dog does bite a child, that's a problem. Um, when the child does fall down the stairs and has a concussion, that is a problem. Um, and so I think we just have to like watch that kind of stuff and maybe think through some of those things 
more than maybe we are in the thinking in the moments right now. My question is, I'm gonna hop in, directly related to that. So I'm in West Virginia. I don't know if anybody's been paying attention to <laughs> West Virginia. Um, so as we begin to like build this non-public infrastructure because it's totally lacking 140 private schools, nine counties only have, or nine counties without a private school at all, 30 counties only have one out of 55. So as we do that, like I'm a small government gal, but this is exactly in line with that. Um, like the educational entrepreneurship, I wanna start a, an educational program. I wanna be a service provider for Hope Scholarship. I'm a for-profit, I'm using a nonprofit space. I'm violating the terms of that property tax exemption. Um, how do we embrace fewer regulations and um, identify the liability that we're placing upon the entrepreneurs? in a state that just passed hope and all eyes are on us. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a challenge, right? I mean, I think this is why it's great that we have this opportunity to get together and kind of figure these things out. Um, I guess right now I'd say, again, the Wild West is, I think it's a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. I think you can kind of craft it. Um, maybe there's room for you to create a nonprofit, the Center for Educational Entrepreneurship in West Virginia mm -hmm. that kind of helps it's West Virginia Families United for well, Education. There you go. You're yeah. Yeah. You got it. But you're kind of cultivating that, right? You're um, helping people get started. You know, I'm sure you all have been through this personally or know people that do, but a lot of uh, these education entrepreneurs are parents trying to solve a problem for their family or teachers who are frustrated with the system, but they don't necessarily know how to start a business. What are some of the issues around LLC? Should they get licensed as a child care or is there an exemption they can pursue? It's that kind of community support and, and business support that I think can be really helpful. It's the marriage of all of it. Like I interviewed the director with the treasurer's office for Hope Scholarship this week. And I said, you know, what are the qualifications going to be for education service providers? Like initially, a lot of folks are just going to have to get a business license. And he said, well, no, I don't know that they'll need a business license. And I'm like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like everyone will need a business license because in the state of West Virginia, you can't do business in West Virginia without a business license. We sure. So, <laughs> well, we'll get into operational licensing. You also have to charge and remit a 6% service tax if you are not governed by operational licensing, so I'm, or uh, occupational licensing. So it's a whole thing, yeah. um, lots of nuance and I kind of have my finger on the pulse of it, so eyes are on me, and trying to figure out how I can usher in um, entrepreneurs who have ideas, people who want to bring their online learning into West Virginia, people who want to start micro schools in West Virginia. Like, I don't want to be a gatekeeper, but at the same time, when I have parents who trust me because I'm the only parent advocate on the ground, Amen. then, they are looking to me as kind of like the vetting process. Like if Jamie says this is a good idea, yeah. then we'll get behind it. So it's a lot of responsibility, <laughs> right? To, to be that person. And you could be your own that. accredited organization then, right? I mean, there, that's I think another opportunity. This is a great moment for you. Figure out sure.